Good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, we'll just give people a few moments to get into the room and we will make a start. Um, hopefully you're here for our cooperation live on accelerating the global change to clean energy. And um, we've got some fantastic speakers this evening, um, but we're just giving people a chance to get in, um, into the room, uh, settle down, get your cup of tea, uh, we've got quite an interesting hour coming up for you. I think that is pretty much everybody in. So um, good evening. Welcome. Um, I'm Emma Hoddinott. I'm Assistant General Secretary at the Cooperative Party. Um, hopefully you are here for the Cooperation Live. Um, and this evening we're looking at the issue of energy. Um, in the run-up to COP26, uh, which is coming ever closer um, in Glasgow, um, we're hosting a whole range of online events um, looking at what action needs to be taken um, to reduce our global emissions. And this evening we're going to be looking at the issue of clean energy. Um, and as cooperators, we're going to be looking at community energy projects, cooperatives, and how actually they can play their part um, in addressing um, climate change. I'm really pleased that we've got two excellent speakers, which you're going to hear from. Um, the first being uh, Leslie Hines, who is chair of Edinburgh Solar Co-op. And we've also got Mark Luntley, who's the um, executive director at Energy um, for All, which is a family of uh, independent energy co-ops. Um, two people who absolutely know their stuff on energy. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing um, from them. Just a few housekeeping um, things. This meeting is being recorded. Um, if you don't want to appear on this recording, then please turn your um, video off. Um, it's also being captioned as well. So if you need to access the captioning, um, you can do that as well. Um, we're forecast um, to have this session for about an hour. Um, we're going to hear from our two brilliant speakers um, and then we will take um, some questions at the end. Um, the questions will be by um, raising hands, um, if that's all right. Um, we will do it um, that way. And I think um, people will be able to um, uh, send messages to uh, myself as well. So if you've got any questions that you want asking um, towards the end, raise your hand or send uh, a message and we'll put those to our excellent panel. But without further ado, and I, I don't think um, she needs much more introduction, is Leslie. Really pleased to have you here um, this evening. Um, and now I'll hand over to you. Hi, thanks very much. It's delightful to be here. Sorry about the voice. I think it's like everyone else now. We're out mixing with people. I think everyone has got a cold of some sort. Um, so just a little introduction to myself. I'm um, Leslie Hines. Um, I was a councillor in Edinburgh um, Council um, for 33 years. I've semi-retired um, for the last near four years um, and was the founding member of the Edinburgh Community Solar Cooperative. Um, and um, I was first of all a representative of the council and then when I came off the council, uh, retired, semi-retired, I then became a, a member, an individual member voted by the members and then um, became the chair and I've just recently um, given up the chair and, um, but I'm still a member of Edinburgh Community so Cooperative. I want to give a, a kind of positive message this evening but I also want to say how difficult it has been to get to where we are at at the moment. Um, in terms of, um, and one of the organisations you're going to hear from tonight, Energy for All, have been absolutely fantastic and brilliant in supporting um, our solar cooperative. And anyone who's considering setting up a solar cooperative, I would suggest you get in touch with Energy for All, because they're the ones that have really supported us um, over the last number of years. This came about because a number of founding members including people like Richard Dixon, who is the chief executive of Friends of Air Scotland, um, and other people for Living Streets, um, and also a couple of um, MSPs and MP, Mark Lazarovich, um, who's cooperative as well, um, and also Sarah Boyack, um, who's cooperative. And they wanted to try to get a project put together. And I won't go into the details of it, but they tried when they tried everything. 
And then I was the convener of um, transport and environment in the council and the leader of our council, um, Andrew Burns, was a big supporter of the environmental movement and the cooperative party and to set up cooperatives. And I think that's quite important to anyone who's considering they might wish to set up a cooperative and particularly in energy is you need the political support now, it might be seen now that all the politicians are saying they're supporting um, energy, uh, changing energy and renewable energy. But I think that's quite, I think that's perhaps because COP26 is coming along in Glasgow. Uh, but the, I cannot emphasise enough the support that you need from political people um, to get this going. And we really have had a good relationship with the council, um, but it was quite difficult to get there. And I think because you had myself, who was interested in the cooperative party and in renewable energy and also leader of the council, that's um, how, how we managed to get it up. So the project is the, was at the, the time the largest community owned um, PV solar scheme of its kind in the UK. Um, and it's, it's 24 buildings. We did start off with 30 and we ended up with 24 buildings in the first phase. Uh, and it was a, a fixed price um, electricity deal that we did with the council uh, for 20 years and then the, the, the three the panels. So it's a community benefit society and it's investing, the members who invest in it will receive the first one 5% as a share interest increasing with inflation. And all surplus profits will be appointed to uh, delivering objectives of the society. Uh, and um, there's 80% of members are residents of Edinburgh. We've just gone through a second phase of six buildings, um, of the you know, other six buildings again with the council. And what seems to be quite interesting, when we did the first phase, we had to market the, market the investment, we had to push out and try to get people, went to markets, put out leaflets, promoted. Uh, but this time, Actually, we got the funding very, very quickly. I think there's a real interest out there of individuals um, who want to basically invest in renewable energy. Now, it, to me, I was explaining this to somebody the other day, it's a win-win because you're helping the environment, you're reducing your carbon footprint by investing, but individually you're getting a return back um, from your investment and also you get your investment back after a certain period of time. And the real advantage of, I think, the, the, the Edinburgh Community Solar Cooperative, all its members have a vote for who should be on the board. All the members then also participate in AGMs and we've done meetings out with. So it's getting people involved and interested. One of the challenges we have found, it's mostly elderly people um, who tended to invest because they've got more money um, than young people. And I think that's one of the challenges we have in terms of that. So from the first phase to the second phase, we reduced the amount of investment down to £100 for the second phase because we wanted to get as many people um, to get involved um, as possible. We also have a community benefit fund, which is projected to produce a million pounds over ne the next 20 years. Uh, and that you know, um, means that we can invest. And what we have done, I believe, is um, put a significant reduction of carbon footprint in the buildings that we've put them together a display panel for educating building. So every child that comes in, parent, teacher, there's information of why we're doing this, what's happening um, with the carbon footprint. And also we have access to funds for improving energy efficiency in the building. And Edinburgh community also can access funds. And I think one of the key issues is about engaging with the local community and ensuring that, that we do that. So the last um, few, um, last year, as I said, we've taken another six panels. We've also got funding um, to put batteries to do a, a project just in two, two buildings. Um, but those two buildings will be looking at batteries because um, how can we storage? How can we use the, uh, the electricity at the times of most need, but also the lowest cost as well? Um, and that's a project that's going on. And what will be interesting from that project to see how it can be adjusted to other buildings. Um, so, um, I suppose my points are is that you need political um, support, you need committed individuals that are willing to put time and effort in. You also need very much to have an organisation like Energy for All that's willing to support you. And I believe that this is the future because we as individuals are contributing to the environment and, and contributing to reducing our carbon footprint, but we're also making sure we keep that issue going and we keep to do that. So I would encourage anyone 
who wishes to get involved with a solar cooperative to do so. It's very encouraging to have so many members that want to participate. Um, uh, and I think that that's, to me, the future for renewable energy has to be the cooperative movement. It's about, in, in, about investing in renewable energy, but also it's not about profit making all the time. It's about the mutual um, understanding and mutual part of it. Um, so go for it and see whether you can get a solar uh, cooperative set up in your area. Thank you very much um, for that, Leslie. Um, and could I just ask about the, the solar panels you're putting on buildings? Are they powering more than just the buildings? Are you, what yeah. happens with the energy? They go to the grid, but obviously people be aware that um, has changed over the years that the Westminster government has taken away um, that the funding in terms of that we would get a certain price from the grid. So that is a bit more challenging in terms of the business plan for the six buildings, but any excess um, el power electricity goes to the grid. And with the first 24 buildings, and I think two out of the six that we've just done, um, we do get a, a set price um, from the grid. But I think that's a key issue. You know, the government talks a lot about investment in the last few days about renewable energy, but that would be great if they could actually go back to what they've previously done and, and in terms of that as an issue um, and to be addressed. So, um, yeah, the excess, and that's why the battery project is going to be interesting because if we do have access, instead of going to the grid, can it be stored? And used at other times and be able to there's obviously the the local electricity bill as well which has been looked at and considered and imagine if we could actually sell that on as well um through a battery process yep, that's great thank you it's just to improve my understanding of what's happening up there in edinburgh and um, you heard reference to um energy um for all and that's a, an opportune moment for me to bring in um mark uh luntley who's going to um talk us through um, uh, about community energy. And Mark, I looked at your CV, um, there's a lot of experience. I didn't know where to start. You've been involved in setting up numerous um, projects and um, involved in, in various ways. So um, I will hand over um, to you. Thank you, thank you so much. And I think Izzy's gonna, we've got some slides. Um, so Izzy is going to organize, uh, is gonna slide share so that I can, so, so focus, not try and not do too many multitasking. Hurrah, that's working. So thank you very much. Um, uh, so I, I've got two bits here and I, I've titled this a people powered energy transition. Um, and you'll be pleased to know it's fairly picture heavy. Every picture tells a story. Um, but I am here from Energy for All, where I represent the co-ops on the Energy for All board. And I'll explain a little bit about that. I also chair West Mill Wind Farm, which was one of the early Energy for All projects. And that's that's how I got involved. And I am also uh, on the board of West Mill Solar, which is the next door co-op where I'm a director. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And in fact, could we have the next slide, please? And I think you'll get to see it. Um, and the, the slide that we're about to show you is one you see everywhere. And it is such a um, joyous slide. So this was the very first um, meeting after we had successfully raised the funds to buy the solar park. So we built the wind farm back in 2008. That was a 15 year planning battle. I got involved right at the end. Uh, and that has two and a half thousand members. We raised the money with help from mid counties who were an early supporter and gave a very public support for that. And the cooperative bank as well supported us. And without those, we would not have been successful. And we then helped um, to create the solar. And solar was it at the time the largest community owned solar project in the world, we believe. Um, it was a 15 million pound project uh, and 1400 people raised the money. And in fact, interestingly, the, the balance of the funds was provided by a local authority pension fund, Lancashire County Council Pension Fund, who were interested in supporting community energy. And that's a long term uh, financing. And so 
um, uh, you, you know, the the landowner Adam and his wife are there, and we had a we had a children's author, and we were naming the turbines, and he's there, and there's a, a whole range of other people. It was a really glorious moment because it had been such a stressful thing to do, and that's the moment that we were celebrating, having had the money to buy the co-op. So I just thought I'd share that. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to sort of send out a spoiler. This is my, this is what I'm arguing in today's talk. If we are going to have a successful energy transition, citizens have to be involved in that. And community ownership is a key way of ensuring citizen involvement. So there are some things that citizens can do in their houses. We were just talking before we came on, I explained about the heat pump we've got here. So there's some things you can do individually. There are some things that nations and councils should be doing and internationally, I'll talk a little bit about that. But in the middle, there's a part which communities can do. And that's the space which we think is really important. So it's not for everything, but for some things. Next slide, please. So uh, I wanted to talk today about community energy, how, and I thought, because we're talking about municipalities, I've got a series of examples, different sorts of examples from different places and different organisations, and not all energy for all, about how councils and communities work together in different ways. And then I, I'm going to set out some conclusions and some suggestions for ways forward. And it's worth saying that I'm not saying it just because you know, I'm involved, but I sit on Community Energy England. I've been on the Low Carbon Hub, which is an Oxfordshire project, and I represent energy for all on something called RESCU, which is the European Federation of Renewable Energy Co-op. So I've lifted quite a few slides from all these different places, of which the next one is just about to come up. So this is community energy across the UK. So every year, uh, Community Energy England does a, they call it a state of the uh, uh, sector report. And they, they look at what's happened, where new renewable energy generation has come from, and how is it doing? So you'll see there's 424 organizations. That's probably an underestimate the, because you know we're working on lists of those. There's 319 megawatts of electricity installed capacity and eight megawatts new. So there is a there is an issue there. Four or five years ago, a lot of community energy was being created. The government changed the rules. The 2015 government came in and made it, they withdrew many of those supports and, and much of the support has been in offshore wind where communities have the least chance of participating. And on the left-hand side, you'll see there's a map. There's more solar in the sunny south, there's more wind in the north, and there's more hydro in the west, which is sort of what you'd expect. Next slide. And this is energy for all. Uh, so um, these are the projects uh, from uh, West Solent in the very south up to uh, Urkel Robert in uh, up there in the north and also um, Kinloch Burvey, where we've got a series of hydro schemes where we're working and putting them in often, often very small hydro schemes. So it doesn't, you know, we're not creating dams and whatever. Um, Energy for All started in Bay, with Baywind in Barrow in Furness. Uh, Baywind was the first project and they decided they wanted to try and create other co-ops. And Westmill was one of their first projects. It was a long, hard slog, but we've grown now to 31 independent co-ops. So we've got 24 staff, half of them roughly in the Barrow office and half of them in other parts of the UK, a significant group in, in Scotland now, but also in, in Bath and in the south of England as well. And we have 31 independent co-ops and I'll just explain how that works in the next slide. And, and it is an interesting model. So the, the right-hand slide is the timeline. Um, and you'll see when they were created. But how does energy for all work? We help communities identify projects because as uh, we were just discussing, it's often somebody's first project. That's incredibly difficult to come up with a model. Um, so we work with the projects uh, and communities to create a project, 
we raise the funds, we help the community build the project, we charge fees to run the co-ops and produce the accounts, and each co-op then becomes a member of our co-op, and some of those fees are used to play it forward to create the next co-ops. So some of what Westmill pays in its management fees goes to help create and support Edinburgh, and Edinburgh goes to support Glasgow, and so forth. Next slide. So I thought I'd start with this before, I, just be, um, because um, I think it's lovely. This is shows that community energy is about climate change, but as well, there are other issues here. There is a biodiversity collapse, which is a huge challenge to us. And this is one of the energy for all projects called Springbok down in, uh, uh, down in the South of England. Um, it is a, it's our sole at the moment, community district heating system, about 24, um, uh, retired seafarers' homes uh, next to, uh, and it's a wood chip boiler, and um, the wood comes from the wood that's next door, and it used to be coppiced until the 1960s, and then it all grew up, and all the biodiversity died away, but because it's now being coppiced and managed sustainably, the wildlife has exploded, and picture on the left, you may have seen it in the Guardian a couple of weeks ago, are um, wood white butterflies, incredibly rare and appeared because the wood is being managed. So it's owned by local people, supplying green electricity, increasing biodiversity in the area. It's just an example of how these things can be managed. And, uh, and, and the community raised about 400,000 to make that happen. So we'll go to the next slide. And so I thought I'd say, how can councils, how can, local authorities and cooperatives work together. And I'm gonna make an argument that as community leaders, and I think Edinburgh was inspirational in doing that and actually using procurement and saying, we will work with other people, not do it ourselves, but work with our local citizens to do it. And, and councils and communities have public buildings with leases and repairs and planning and procurement. And, and there are different ways in which you can uh, support with pre-financing, with post-financing and with structures. And I'm gonna give some examples of those sorts of ideas. But one of the important things is councils, I think are incredibly important in what is an over-centralized country or countries. Uh, and that is that, that actually they are the places that are democratic representatives of local people. So the next slide is the first of the examples. So one of the, uh, projects that we are really very proud of is the schools co-op um, and that has grown there's over 80 schools around the UK now have solar panels on their roofs uh, and very much as Edinburgh do and others have done as well and it has a number of advantages the schools often use a lot of electricity so much of the consumption is within the school and um, also it's a fantastic education resource. And I remember the low carbon hub AGM and the best speaker we ever had was a primary school teacher. You know, he, he loved it because he had a willing audience. He didn't have people running around or whatever. He actually had people who were interested in what to he, he had to say. And boy, could he convey all of this, the, the low carbon and climate change agenda really clearly. And Salisbury Cathedral are also members of this and their uh, area there, you'll see they put a solar panel. So we have panels on a cathedral and I realize I'm going too slowly, so I'll speed up the next slide. And this is another example. This is a different group. This is called the Low Carbon Hub. And there is a hydro scheme, standard hydro, three um, Archimedes screws and Rose Hill School. For those of you who know Oxford, Rose Hill is quite a poor part of Oxford, a lot of deprivation. And they put a number of panels on schools. But what's interesting there is Oxford City um, has supported the low carbon hub and they pre-finance the hub. So they help create it um, and they work with the county council and with uh, um, the low carbon hub and the community groups within Oxfordshire. And they have a vision where as Didcot power station has been taken offline and the person who switched it on, switched it off, which is pretty amazing. 
Um, they got him out of retirement to do it, but he still switched it off. What the low carbon hub are doing is saying, how do we replace Didcot power station? And they're doing that by a, a combination of powering down and efficiency and powering up in generation. And what the city council have done is say, we don't have huge amounts of resources, but we can lend money into this institution, three and a half million pound revolving credit facility. Because what that then means is um, the hub was able to put in solar panels ahead of the feed in tariff changing deadlines and the same with Sanford Hydro. And then they're able to raise the capital to repay that. And it's easier to raise capital if you can point to a hydro scheme that's already built rather than the plan. So that's one way councils can work. Next slide. And then I thought I uh, would talk about, um, I just could continue talking about UK ones, but I thought I'd talk about a couple of examples from my rescue family of uh, other councils elsewhere. So I'm going to mangle the name Padjo Power in Halle, in Belgium. And the council there didn't have the funds and they wanted to do work to improve the energy efficiency of the municipality. And citizens raised the quarter of a million uh, euro to replace the lights with LED lighting. So they provided a loan to the municipality. The municipality put on street lights on all of the four uh, routes into the city. And uh, they generate a five to six percent return to that co-op. So they do that by um, by the savings in the electricity that have come because it's it's so much cheaper to run with LEDs. And they ran a motto of adopt your streetlight. So people were actually buying the shares in the streetlight closest to them. So that was the city of Halle. So there the council was had, had the assets and they provided that. So the next slide is another example. This is a, um, a Courant d'Air uh, project. And Courant d'Air is one of the two co-ops in Belgium. The other one is called Ecopower. Uh, Ecopower is in the Dutch speaking, Courant d'Air is in the um, French uh, speaking. This is actually in the German speaking area. They put turbines up, four turbines, and they wanted a model with citizen participation as a prerequisite. And uh, so they did a public tender and they awarded it to this uh, group, uh, Courant Air Eco Power, and it's 50% citizen ownership. Interestingly enough, EDF, who lost because they put in a big bid, um, state owned appealed, and uh, it went to the courts, and the courts found in favor of Amel and Bullingham, saying actually community ownership is a legitimate reason to choose a different. A different contractor. And so this is a model where the, the municipality puts in funds and so do the citizens. And that, you know, again, with municipalities using their resources to be able to invest also gives certainty for citizens to invest. And there are other examples. There's uh, one in Bel in France called BC, a very similar model. Um, and indeed, in other parts of the UK, in Charbury, where I live, there's a community energy project. And the local council has refinanced the fairly expensive loan from uh, a, a private bank. And the council is now getting a better rate of interest than they would get if they put the money in the bank. And the co-op has saved money on what they were paying to pay from the bank. So next slide with a different model. And this one is a community heating system. This is Zuitrant, I think it's called. And this is district heating network in Antwerp. It's in the Antwerp docks and in the Antwerp docks, they're regenerating it. They're putting in 400 houses. And uh, again, they wanted the a district heating system because it's much more efficient. And uh, they're, they're working with the local co-op. The municipality went to see how this was happening in Denmark, where there is a district heating service and they've got rid of the gas pipeline. Um, and they're building it, as I say, in the harbour. Uh, it's using an old incinerator. Uh, so the incinerator where the heat just used to go up into the air uh, from the council is now going to heat the home. So about 300 homes uh, started in 2019. They reckon that they will save 16,000 tonnes of CO2 over 10 years. So next slide. So here are some thoughts then. 
um, really try to draw that together. I've gone at about 100 miles an hour. I think decarbonizing heating is going to be one of the next big issues. And I wrote this before the net zero uh, strategy came out. I've said that. I think there's some really interesting things in transport as well, where we're going to need a lot of um, uh, electric charging. And Oxford, for example, are looking at how, again, we could have cooperative electric charging. I think um, if you think about uh, all of our co-op shops around the UK, wouldn't it be great if the charging points there were owned by the people who are shopping in the shops. I think that is about procurement. I would suggest that it's more than what we're talking about is a model instead of one where people pay their money to a company and a company's shares go elsewhere and the money goes elsewhere, the money stays in an area. And I think that's incredibly important. So half of West Mills members, for example, live in the local area. And it helps changing attitudes. 10,000 people, uh, well over 10,000 people have visited West Mill. I think we're up at 13, 14,000 now. We showed a slightly stunned English woman and her Dutch husband who'd cycled there and said, you are the 10,000th that gave them a certificate. And they're on the video that we've got that we can show you the next year that talking about that. And we exhibited low carbon cars. And it shows how things happen nearby. And so community energy can be small, but it can also be larger. And I think the next slide is my last one. I put this in because I wanted just to say about cooperation and energy. So this is a group of us. So I picked all my favorite slides, basically. I've just sort of assembled them as examples here. And this is uh, in Eiffel, which is on the border of Belgium and uh, Germany and it was all of us working to create and we're hoping to launch this year a fund that will invest in co-ops across Europe and it'd be incredibly difficult morning the French who'd been doing the work had not produced what the Dutch thought they were going to do so the Dutch got angry and I was trying to sort of smooth it all off and we all went off at lunchtime to sort of cool down and what I just show is there are French, Spanish, American, Dutch, French, British people there and working together. You can spot the French boy in the middle uh, um, who is hopelessly underdressed for the whole thing and looks completely frozen in his yellow jacket. But that is the border. That is a group of young people working together to decarbonize the future through co-ops. 70 years ago, their grandparents as young people were killing each other. So there is a positive message about the value of cooperation in an energy transition. Just like to leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And you very eloquently take, taken us from the, the very local and, and how you started to that international um, cooperation and absolutely on an issue tackling climate change, those international links are really important and gives us some big um, thoughts uh, to take away, which is where I hand over to, to you. Um, if you've got any questions or anything you'd like to um, put to the panel at all, um, you can do it by either raising your hand um, or you can message us um, in the chat box um, as well. Um, so feel free to, to, um, to, to do that. Um, I appreciate that, um, Somebody is trying to put their hand up. I can't quite see who. Um, but um, I'm going to go to Leslie first because I know you've got to um, head off um, a, a, bit, a bit earlier. Um, but I do have a, a question around um, what kind of buildings are you using for your solar panels? Um, they're, they're all owned by the council. Um, the majority of them are schools or leisure centres. Uh, but recently put quite a large number of um, solar panels on the top of the council headquarters. Um, uh, but also one, a couple of issues linked to that is sometimes the roofs are not suitable. Um, uh, so therefore that is a kind of challenge. So when you start off, I would always start off too many buildings um, because you end up having some that are just not suitable. There's also an issue regarding the national grid. 
um, where we had, um, I think, two, if not three buildings, and they wanted to put solar panels on. Um, but because the, the grid was full, as they, as they described it, full, I'm sure that's not the technical word, was because we didn't have, we, we could not get access to the national grid. Um, so that is another issue. Um, I'm not sure it was just Edinburgh, there was other, uh, other areas as well. Um, but it's because there's quite a lot of new buildings um, going up. Um, and linked to that as well is that we're quite keen to try and make them more visible um, so that people are aware as they're going past. Yeah. And also we were for the second phase wanting to, to move more in the old town or the new town of Edinburgh um, because the majority of them, in fact, all of them in the first phase um, were on um, buildings out with the city centre. As you could imagine, Edinburgh in terms of planning and, and, and getting planning permission and that was quite um, a cut challenge as well. So mostly, public buildings, schools, leisure centres, those kind of buildings. So public buildings. Um, and just to say, um, if you're struggling to put your hand up, um, you can drop us a message in the chat as well. If you're looking for it, it varies on what device you're using. Uh, but for me, it's under reactions and there's a raise hand um, function. And Mark Hutton, you have very um, ably put up your hand. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, first of all, I wanted to say how inspirational it was to hear from both Leslie um, and, and from Mark about their about the work that they, they've been doing. Um, but I've got a, a question really for Mark, and that is, it, I think you're working both on hydro and on uh, um, wind and also on, on solar power. And I just wondered, what's the where do you think the greatest potential lies? Is it with is it with wind? And my second question is, um, one of the really important things to do is to be able to store electricity. And I think Leslie mentioned that in her in her in her in her um, uh, uh, points. Um, but I wondered whether in the hydro stuff, are you able to store electricity at all? Okay. Um, I'm not a hydro expert, so uh, the two questions there. Where is the greatest potential? One of the interesting things is Energy for All just went public with, um, uh, and one of the biggest areas has been offshore wind. And uh, what we are starting to see is uh, in different countries, co-ops starting to say, cannot some of that very large offshore wind generation be owned by the citizens who are using the electricity? Now, it's not immediately next door, of course, because it's off at sea, um, but um, uh, we, Energy for All, made a public announcement now that we're working with uh, a number of organisations in Scotland, dealing with uh, a partnership to look at offshore wind and a part of, and the developers working to say energy for all should represent that as part of that. So I think that's quite exciting if, if that can be made to work. And that's also happening in Belgium and Netherlands and to an extent in France and to a small extent in Spain as well. So you know, offshore wind might well be a big potential. I would love there to be onshore wind, particularly in England. Scotland has been vastly more sympathetic to these things than England. It's, it's much, much more difficult. I think costs of uh, uh, solar continue to fall, which is really interesting. So projects that aren't viable now will become viable. And I think the opportunity is actually integrating this often with uh, just talking about local authorities and the point that Leslie was making, integrating it with repair work on buildings. So I used to work in a local government and I said, well, for goodness sake, put the solar panels on at the same time as you're repairing the roofs, not two years beforehand. So that's uh, a good thing. In, in terms of storage, I think storage is also becoming cheaper. West Mill, wind and solar are looking together at storage. And it's interesting that wind generates electricity in the wind, in the winter and solar, obviously, in the summer. So you, you by putting different technologies together, you can make improvements and smooth the grid. And we are looking at whether a battery will work as well. And we, 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 we've worked with the hub to actually do work and show when is the grid overloaded, as Leslie was saying. And we pay for a certain amount of grid capacity and the batteries allow us to do more. 
Um, I mean, what I understand it in very simplistic terms is we generate the solar during the day when prices are low, and we sell it in the evening when prices are high. And that seems the logic, but I, the people who know more about it than me say it's more complicated than that. Is that, does that answer the question? Yes, yes, yes. thank you, so, thank you very much. Can I just um, ask Leslie, um, any sort of final thoughts on, on that or in general before you um, leave us this evening? I'm quite happy to stay on if there's more questions, to be honest. Uh, maybe the meeting I don't want to go. It was just a, it wasn't <laughs> my diary. It was a previous week. Um, it might be quite controversial, so maybe I'm better to stay out because I might just start shouting at people. Um, I don't know. Well, we've got um, plenty of questions. <laughs> don't worry. If, if you uh, want to avoid the other I'll, I'll just stay on. It's fine. So long as it's finished at half past, that'll be fine. I mean, just know the battery one. It will be interesting how the project does develop. Mm. And one of the issues as well is that why don't we nationalise the national grid? You know, that's one of the things. If we could do that, I think we'd be, I just find the whole kind of e energy um, system so complex um, and people are better than me that are understanding it. Um, but I think maybe nationalising the national grid would be quite useful. And also, as it's been said, is solar. You know, we would not have been able to do the solar panels on these buildings, on the six buildings previously, because the costs have come down in the business plan. Um, that didn't, wouldn't stack up previously. Um, so that's an issue to, to come forward with. And I, I think it is quite interesting about the whole offshore wind. And I'm aware of that, uh, Mark, because there have been some discussions with um, also the solar cooperative. So I think, yeah, I think the future is to be all. We need to look at all alternatives uh, and ensure that people get involved with the community. Great stuff. So thank you for the messages that are coming in. So there's a, a couple of specific ones that I'm going to ask uh, Leslie and Mark. Um, so, Leslie, there's one about regulations uh, for solar power on buildings. How did you, how do you deal with the regulations and are there regulations? I guess you can't just stick them anywhere in Edinburgh. Um, and there's a, a second question, Mark, if you want to uh, pick this one up about whether you've looked at geothermal schemes. Um, deep drilling uh, is what it's called in, in brackets. Um, so whether you'd considered that. So, Leslie, do you want to go first just about the, um, I guess, the regulations for solar power? Yeah, I usually leave that to other people and officers <laughs> to deal with that. But because you've got a relationship with the council, then there was a quite a complex process to go through in terms of some buildings would need planning permission. You also would have to be them inspected in terms of whether they were suitable, the weight of the solar panels, the type of the roofing. So there's quite a kind of detailed process to go through and also to get building control warrants as well. And um, so, you know, the support and help we got from Energy for All, but also council officials um, had to go through that whole process. And I think, I think the key thing for people who might be interested is that uh, I'm aware that that Glasgow, for example, were looking for a small project uh, and we passed, obviously confidentially, but we passed our kind of data and our paperwork that we carried out to them so that it would help them. And it's about saying that, you know, we should all be trying to help each other. So if we've gone through processes in terms of regulations, et cetera, and we've learned through that process, I think we should be sharing that knowledge and information to other, other solar cooperatives as well. I was going to say, Leslie makes a really good point there, and, and it's one of the things that uh, we at Westmill get constant requests for information of a half hour data and what's happened from all sorts of academics and people who are looking at different ideas, because private developers just don't give that information out. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, so it's about, and we sponsored a graduate student uh, last year, University of Lancaster, and she came up with a whole range of recommendations about how you could improve uh, uh, cooperativeness in community energy. So we're actually looking to employ somebody to take that, those ideas forward. In terms of uh, geothermal, we haven't had a geothermal scheme in Energy for All. I, I did actually go and talk once in my old day job when I was working at the LGA uh, uh, for, uh, uh, to um, Southampton, who did have a geothermal uh, scheme back in the 60s and 70s. And it was really just a very good, I hope I'm not going to talk out of line, a uh, good example of I said, you know, this is the perfect thing. Get everybody in Southampton to have a share in this project. And they looked at me and said, well, we've really got to do it very, very quickly. We're under pressure as officers. 
we've got to get it done now so we'll do it ourselves and you know years later nothing's happened so i you know i i think those sort of opportunities and and thinking about involving people tends to lead to more robust projects so we'd be up for such a thing but of course it has to be in the right place i imagine if it will happen it'll happen down in cornwall where there's some very active community energy groups and where geothermal works better there thank you um so i've got john you've got your hand up if you want to come in john morland yeah um yeah, these seem <clears throat> sort of quite large scale projects using council buildings and wind farms. Um, is it feasible to have a cooperative um, installing domestic solar panels and insulation? Thank you, John. Mark, Leslie, I don't know who wants to jump in first. Did you want me? Uh... I, there has been a bit of a history of, uh, I, I think, domestic installation is hard. Um, uh, I um, There was a co-op that tried to do it and it, it wasn't successful. Um, there are others around that are trying to do this work, Carbon Co-op in Manchester. And um, we've been uh, trying to support that through Westmill to try and help because our feeling is our members are two and a half thousand win 1600 solar members are probably people who would want to do this sort of thing and we're sort of trying to think about ways of working with our members on improving the environmental performance of their own homes uh, but the frankly the, the challenge we have is all the builders who want to do it you probably you know, are not that experienced, let me put it like that. And the experienced builders have got long waiting lists of people to do, to do their work. Uh, the Low Carbon Hub is trying to do something called Cozy Homes, and there are Cozy Home projects in uh, Oxford and in uh, East Sussex and in parts of London. And so there are some models around, but it's, it's not easy. Uh, and I think it's, it's about working with the building industry who had quite a long range of skills and talents. Let me put it like that. Could I also say, I think it is more difficult, even if you talk about individual homes, we've had discussions over the years, for example, with churches um, and other organisations who would like to be part of the solar cooperative. Um, 